Salut et bienvenue. My name is Brandon, and I'm here at a very muggy Oshkosh 2023 to talk about the TB30 Epsilon made by Sakata. The best way I can describe this airplane is it flies like a jet with piston engine prices. So it is uh, the newest Warbird onto the scene with most of them coming and delivered into the States about 2017, all the way up until 2023. So we'll talk about what makes this airplane unique from any of the other piston engine trainers uh, out here on the market today. So just some history about the airplane. This particular one, serial number 125, was made in 1986, but the program for this particular airplane goes all the way into the 1970s. When France was flying the Fuga Magister, as their primary trainer in their Air Force pilot training program, it was a complex airplane that was burning a lot of gas. So after the October 1973 war and the oil crisis that resulted out of that, the French Defense Ministry decided that we need to lower costs and make a more economic trainer. So there was a couple of different programs, but the program that eventually went out became known as the TB30 Epsilon. So as we go here, why the, why the name Epsilon? So the airplane that this would lead into to was called the Alpha Jet, and that was their new advanced trainer that replaced the T-33 in French Air Force service. So as a homage to that, they called the aircraft the Epsilon for E for Ecole, which means school in, in French. So that's why they call the airplane the Epsilon. So the program began in uh, 1978 with the first flight taking, uh, taking place in December 22nd. And it was flown by test pilot Mark Yeo, and it looks very similar to this, but as we go around, the airplane had different tail, which proved to be a little bit problematic for spin recovery. So the eventual production aircraft look very similar, but with a new with a new tail from when the prototype uh, first uh, took off there. After that, the uh, program advanced to where the all the airplanes were introduced in the French Air Force Service in 1982, and production lasted all the way into up until 1988. Ultimately, 150 airplanes were produced, and then they were flown in the French Air Force as well as export to Portugal, Togo, and Senegal. The airplanes lasted all the way up until 2019, and then uh, the air aircraft were retired from, the, from that point. Serial number 125, as best we can tell, flew all the way up until 2013, where it was then demobilized, but then a few uh, people were able to bring the aircraft over uh, into the United States after that, where it remains today. So as far as you can tell with, the, with this airplane, it's piston powered, but it's designed to be a primary trainer which leads efficiently into jets. What that means is overall, this airplane has a very small wing. It's kind of, if a T-34 made it with the Glass Air 3. The square footage of this wing is only about 98 square feet. So for being a primary trainer, it's one of the smallest wings out there. If you compare it to aircraft of similar size, they have a lot fatter wing, but this one is designed to produce basically the same roll rates and the same landing characteristics that you would find with a jet or more advanced jet trainers. It's designed to be uh, efficiently lead into that using a piston engine power plant. The power plant behind me is a Lycoming AEIO 540. So it's the same power plant that you'd find on an extra 300 or a Christian Eagle. So everything firewall forward is pretty much made in the United States with some, with some French components, but the majority is American design. You also have a Hartzell variable pitch constant speed propeller and that is controlled in the typical manner by both cockpits with a, with a propeller control. One of the cool things about that first attracted me to this airplane was the measurement spinner that we have on it. It can hypnotize uh, the person trying to taxi it in, but that's one of the cool, uh, cool features right there. So the constant speed, uh, variable, uh, variable pitch prop, usually when we're flying around, the maximum RPM is 2700, and then we'll have that for takeoff and also for formation flying. For operational purposes, if we have to uh, fly just from A to B, or if we're doing any type of airbags training, we're gonna be uh, um, basically reducing the RPM to 2500 to 2500 RPM, which is where the engine likes to, likes to hang out at. So the AEIO 540 is a six cylinder horizontally opposed engine. It has both an inverted fuel and oil system. So with the inverted oil system, it allows the aircraft to uh, have, hold up to negative G flight. So the power plant is the AEIO 540. Again, it was used in an extra 300 or a Christian Eagle. And this is the power plant that the French went with since uh, they were developing their own indigenous piston power plant that actually run on jet kerosene, which would be useful for third world countries because 100 low lead was not as prevalent. 
one uh, down in Africa. However, that project really went nowhere, so they were uh, going with the uh, with the Lycoming engine. Six cylinder horizontally opposed, developing 300, uh, 300 horsepower. It's non turbocharged, so it's normally aspirated at sea level, very sprightly performance. However, where we're up in Boulder, Colorado, it uh, produces around 650 millibars of pressure, which is about 25, uh, 25 inches of mercury on a uh, normal engine. From there, from the spinner, we have our air filter in the uh, in the front. We also have the landing and tax lights. There's nothing nothing on the wing, so these aren't any LEDs. It's just normal light bulbs for both the uh, taxi and landing lights. As we go down to the nose gear, this is uh, one of the unique things on the uh, on the aircraft. As you can see, it's a trailing link design, so they uh, deviated from what they had on their TB20 and uh, TB uh, TB10 and TB20 series of aircraft to make this a lot stronger for uh, student training. So they. Have this trailing link design and this casting, and they also have this shimmy dampener out here, which also serves as the centering mechanism uh, for the nose gear. So, when you're pre flying the airplane, all these linkages are very critical because if you have any slop or play or any type of uh, damage to the shimmy dampener, this uh, linkage, due to its trailing link design, is more prone to shimmy. So, if it does shimmy, it could uh, damage the motor mount. So, we always make sure that we double check all these fittings, make sure the snap rings are attached, and then we make sure that uh, we have a uh, good a good fit before uh, before we go fly so as we go go around the front this is our one of our intakes for both cabin heating and cooling so as we go around the other side we'll have a couple of NACA scoops to provide a lot of fresh air which is essential since we have no onboard air conditioning but this is another vent for both our hot and cold air which can make the aircraft really comfortable at uh, in most climates which is uh, really nice when we're flying in the winter time this compartment up here is actually folds. So if you see this piano hinge right here, when we get into the cockpit, if I hit a trigger, I'm able to open the canopy like a uh, like a bread basket. That makes it really easy to access a lot of the instrumentation, also the electric hydraulic pump in the aircraft. So even though the aircraft is really small, if we have to do any type of any type of avionics repair or get a, any of the voltage regulators, we just pop this open. And it can actually make it a lot easier versus trying to come up from the back of the uh, back of the firewall right there as well. People ask, so what is this globe right here? So this is the Aerospatial logo. So even though the aircraft was uh, developed by Cicada, which is basically the French business aviation company, this uh, company was owned by a couple of conglomerates. First one was Aeros Aerospatial in the 1980s. However, into the 1990s and 2000s, the company was owned by EADS and also Airbus, and finally is with uh, De Heer. That might sound familiar because they make the TBM series of aircraft. So so in this factory goes all the way back to the days of Marine Saulnier and back into the 1900s. And so this airplane was actually built in one of the oldest aircraft factories in the world because that lineage goes all the way back to the original Marine Saulnier designs, the French aviation industry, which is, which is pretty cool. This nose art right here, shout out to my wonderful wife, Ellen. So, Le Vision de Ellen. A couple ways to translate it. First one is Ellen's escape. So from Colorado, we can get to the beach in approximately five hours. But some other people also translate it as escaping Ellen. But uh, but she likes she loves to fly, and uh, without her without her support, we wouldn't be able to keep this air airplane flying. So so we like to put her and always make sure that uh, she gets her dual recognition on, on the on the airplane. As we go to the wing, we'll talk about the uh, the airflow. This laminar airflow design very critical not to encounter any type of icing. So this is why, even though it's white, we have this black stripe right here to make sure that if we see any type of icing whatsoever, uh, just like any, you know, basically uh, non-icing rated airplane, we have to get icing very quickly. So with the black markings, we're able to see the rime ice pick up a little bit, little bit sooner and uh, get out of it. So we have a bunch of uh, bonding grounding straps. So we have uh, on the top, also on the landing gear, and also on the wingtips for be able to uh, bond the aircraft and ground it uh, to make sure that we don't get any fumes lined off. Two tanks on the aircraft. So each one uh, holds 100 low lead and 27.75 gallons. So for a total of 50, uh, 55 gallons. Most of, the air, uh, most of the aircraft measurements in the inside are actually metric, but we're trying to change them to Imperial as we go on, which makes it just easier to fly with the instrumentation that, that we use. Thank <laughs> you. 
Two fuel tanks on board the aircraft for a total of 50, uh, 55 gallons. The actual control for the fuel is in the front cockpit only, but it does have a dual repeater to let the instructor in the back know which fuel tank that the uh, student is operating on. Primarily, you're going to be operating off of the right fuel tank, especially for uh, takeoff and for landing. But when you're operating on a longer range mission, you'll be able to transfer the fuel tank between the left and the right. Each one goes to a center collector tank, and from there, there's an electric boost pump, which leads to a engine driven fuel pump, which will actually deliver fuel to the engine. Most of the time when we're flying on a, like a normal aerobatic sortie where we just go up and down loops and rolls, all that stuff, we're going to be burning approximately about 16 gallons an hour. But when we climb above 10,000 feet, we can actually lean the aircraft to an economical operation about 12 and a half gallons an hour, which gives us a rough true airspeed of 100 of 180 knots. So when we get up high, this uh, airplane really turns into an economical machine if we have to go long, uh, longer uh, than about like 200 miles or so. So as we go along, go along the wing, standard position light, standard strobe light, really high vis markings, which make it easy to uh, easy for uh, the train program. And then we get to the ailerons. Key thing here is the ailerons are pretty pretty small, and they did that specifically to mimic the roll rates of the jets. So when we get up to about 180 knots, all the way up to a V and E of 281 knots, we have these uh, these trim tabs right here, and also these servo tabs up here that will increase the control pressure, but we make it very jet-like handling. So the people that have flown this airplane onto the Alpha Jet is actually will mimic jet like handling very, uh, uh, very readily, which is good for such an economical trainer and uh, be able to have that. So you're not going to be flying around like an extra 300 doing 280 degrees per second, but the roll rate on the airplane is, is fairly decent to, to mimic uh, some of the military trainers that they're going to be flying later on. So flaps are really vital on this airplane. Since the square footage of the wing is so uh, so high and the wing loading is also so high, it's really critical to get uh, flaps out for approach and landing and also well for takeoff. So on the in the actual manual, two degrees are specified, 15 and 25 degrees. So the flaps are run right next to the throttle on electric switch. But in case of the student uh, tries to override the instructor, the rear cockpit always has the electric control uh, with, with the flaps. As we go along the wing and onto, onto the fuselage, other thing that makes this aircraft unique is the canopy opening and locking system. So if we look at the canopy here, we have the front for the student pilot and then the rear two transparencies for the instructor pilot. Here we have the locking and latching mechanism, but the two canopies are actually connected together through these little these little jaws right here. So there's actually a wire which leads from uh, this locking lever here through the arch of the canopy onto the actual locking lever, which is uh, what you use when you get in and out of the airplane. So when the, everyone's ready to strap in, the front cockpit will slide his canopy forward, hit his latch, and then the rear cockpit will also slide forward, be latched from the right-hand side, and now the two canopies are connected together. When they're flight testing the airplane, they're trying to figure out how they're actually going to escape in case of any airborne emergency. So the question was, would you have enough ability from inside the cockpit to open the canopy? The answer is no. So in order to make it safe, they have these decoupage pyrotechnique, which are explosive charges, which will actually shatter the canopy. This particular airplane has been uh, deactivated, but in case of emergency, what the pilot would do is pull this pin and then slide that tab forward. And then this transparency and then this transparency would shatter and then the occupants would be able to bail out of the aircraft. So that is what their technique would be. And then they would have a strong impulse and basically jump from the cockpit onto the back of the wing to be able to escape. So that was their, their bailout procedure. From here, there's a baggage compartment. So not good for a week long cross country, but for two days, you can fit up to 40 pounds of baggage in the back. So it's enough to basically take you from a, just a, on a weekend vacation, which is perfectly fine by us. So, but this is where you can uh, put the put the baggage. Also, uh, the military aircraft had a G recorder back there. So it would be able to analyze some of the flight. And just prior to its retirement, EADS was putting a system which would have virtual briefing and debriefing 
uh, to be able to teach their fighter pilots basically where they were in formation, how the flight went. So it was a first generation type of system, which with their new PC-21s is already built in, built in. So it was trying to merge 1980s technology to be able to, uh, to teach 21st century pilots. So that would also exist in the baggage right here. Here is just a standard uh, GPU plug. So in case it's cold out, we have low battery power, we'll be able to just plug in an external power unit uh, to be able to, uh, be able to start the engine. Here's our uh, just static, operates just like any other particular uh, general aviation aircraft. And then this is not an N number, this is actually the code for the airplane. So 315 is for the base that the aircraft was at, which is in the Cognac Chateau Bernard, all the way up until 2013, where the aircraft was demobilized and put into storage. And then this particular airplane is known as Yankee Papa, and then we just have our normal uh, end number right here. This aircraft is the 125th airplane produced, and the French uh, Air Force examples went up to number 150. If we go down here, we can see this ventral strake. This aircraft built to part uh, 23, so for the spin characteristics, actually will recover hand, uh, hands off if you have enough altitude. For most of most of the time, uh, they teach anti-spin recovery, so opposite rudder and a forward on the stick. But if you do hold all the controls in the neutral position, the aircraft uh, aircraft will recover. But from some of the other airplanes I've flown, the spin characteristics on this are a little bit more more violent, but uh, a little bit more challenging for the student pilot. But nothing without. Uh, a little practice they can actually master, which makes them overall better pilots to avoid any type of spin and then doing their spin prevent techniques. As we go on to the tail, uh, typical, uh, typical tail that you would find on the TB-10 and TB-20 aircraft. And then all the controls here, no cable buses used for the primary controls. It's all gonna be uh, push rods from the cockpit, both an elevator, rudder control, and, um, and elevator control as well. As well. So people at air shows ask me what this symbol is on the tail all the time. So this is the symbol of the EPAA, which is a French acronym for French Air Force Flying School. Throughout their various history, they have had four squadrons. The first one is a pig. The reason why that's significant is that's the mascot for the EPAA. So all the students that are going through, especially for pre-solo, they actually have to go to a farm, which is in Cognac, and they actually have to take care of these gigantic pigs that they sometimes let loose in the squadron, which is a, which is uh, can be uh, pretty hilarious at times. The second squadron is the Iguana, which is known as Moloch the Monster. And then this, which actually looks like a Smurf head, is actually the third flight instruction squadron, which is Rumi, which stands for Roman, uh, Roman soldier. So that's a Roman soldier holding a shield and a sword. And the fourth squadron, Raphio, is a eagle with a scroll. So those are the various squadrons that have existed throughout the EPA's history. And now they have two squadrons, which are still fly the PC-21. Uh, trained students to this day. So as we see with the uh, with the tail and also very small control surfaces, which they took off of the uh, TB10, and then we talked about on the prototype how it was different from the production models. On the prototype, instead of this conventional layout here, it actually had a cruciform tail with a long fairing in the front to provide stability. However, they found through the flight testing that the spin characteristics were not suitable for student training because sometimes it would take an excessive amount of altitude to be able to recover from the spin. So after a redesign, aircraft number two had this uh, layout here with the horizontal stabilizers and the, and the elevator uh, down in its present position today. What you also notice, aircraft all metal except for fabric covered flight control surfaces. So we'll see on these on the elevator and also for the rudder. The reason why they did that, just like any other World War II airplane, was to prevent flutter. So at higher speeds, especially when we get up to 280, 281 knots, they found that any type of metal control uh, surface would produce flutter, so to be able to counteract that, they used uh, uh, fabric. So they still use, uh, still use fabric, which is uh, pretty cool for a modern aircraft. Trim tabs, which operate just like any other conventional airplane. Most of the trim forces is actually flying this airplane with two, with two fingers. So as long as you're able to trim the aircraft up nicely, very stable IFR platform if trimmed. So it really teaches the student to be on the ball with establishing a known pitch and power, trimming out all the control, uh, control forces, and then be able to cross check and adjust. But if a student does those out of order, they'll find that just like a jet, it's gonna be extremely pitch sensitive and they won't be able to hold an altitude. But 
It really enforces good student habits, so that makes it uh, really efficient going into instruments, leaning into instruments in a high performance jet, which is, uh, which is pretty nice. Again, the trim tab. This, mean, this means that don't push the aircraft from here because some of the control, uh, again, especially on the fabric and some of the lighter metals here. And then as we go into this side, aircraft, as it came out of the military, two different sets of radios. The top one is gonna be for our VHF radio. And then the bottom aerial down here will be for our UHF radio. So the aerial is still there. However, the, uh, the radio itself has been removed from the avionics rack. Otherwise, there's a transponder antenna. And then as we go up here, again, we see the transparency, which is going to shatter in case of bailout as, a bailout as required. In addition to that, along here, the ground crew can also initiate the canopy, uh, canopy fracture system. So they would have to crack this particular glass, grab the lanyard, run out as far as possible, and then pull aggressively on the handle, uh, the handle and then both cartridges would activate at the, at the same time. As we go along for the wing, we talk about G-loading. As the aircraft progressed, it, when it was first designed, it had really high G-loading, upwards of nine Gs. However, as the, as the aircraft progressed and doing a fatigue monitoring program, right now we're operating about positive 5.5 Gs. Most of the time though, doing any type of aerobatics, entry airspeeds for the over-the-top maneuvering, anywhere between 200 and 220 knots. With that type of airspeed, four Gs is about the most you need to be able to be able to fly the aircraft in the, um, uh, with a lot of vertical, gives about 2,500 feet of vertical turn radius for any type of looping maneuver. So we get nowhere near between uh, five and a half Gs, and overall the aircraft is really comfortable to fly for any, ty any type of aerobatic maneuvering, and especially um, any types of clover leaves, barrel rolls, pretty much any military flight maneuver, it performs this, um, perform it very, very effortlessly, especially for a, uh, for a piston powered airplane. As we go down here, Typical tie, uh, tie down ring. And then as we go along the bottom side of the wing, we'll see a static air temperature probe, which will be uh, read from both, uh, from both cockpits. And then we get to the landing gear. One of the things that they learned, especially with their TB-10 and the TB-20 aircraft, is they wanted to use trailing link landing gear, especially in the student training environment. So this gear, even though we have a fairly small strut, can take a lot of punishment. So you can actually drop this airplane from 15 feet up and we'll still have enough action to be able to absorb all that shock. So obviously you don't want to do that consistently, but for a student training airplane, it has very robust gear. And so it can almost turn any bad landing into a smooth one, which is, uh, which is, pre which is uh, pretty nice. As we move along here, this is the uh, fuel vent, so prov uh, providing positive fuel pressure for our both uh, both wing tanks. And then as we go onto the fuselage, then we'll see where the fuel leads in from the left and right fuel tanks into the collector tank. And then it leads forward into a gas escalator. And then from there, it will be sent into the engine and then onwards uh, into the cylinders. As we go here, we have these two NACA scoops. These provide fresh air. Uh, for both uh, occupants. So the higher you go, the cooler the air is going to be. But it provides such a large mass of air that even when flying when hot temperatures in the mountains and midday, you'll still feel uh, fairly cool, which is important because you'll be wearing a flight suit strapped in with a, with a parachute. There's going to be a lot of equipment. So by even uppers of 8,000, 10,000 feet provides enough cool air to even without air conditioning, you'll still be able to function on the sortie. All right, welcome to the cockpit of the Epsilon. As you can see, tandem, front student in the front, instructor is gonna be a back, except in instrument uh, training stories, the student would actually be in the back and they would utilize a blind flying hood and there's also additional instrumentation. So they would have uh, the student be in the back for those type of sorties, which is uh, pretty typical uh, even to this day for, uh, military, for military instruction. Go from the top left all the way across, we have our clock. This is actually one of the uh, most uh, rare elements of the airplane. So when the aircraft were going in for demobilization, people always wanted to try to get the clock. So uh, so it's really nice that we have both the clocks in the front and aft cockpit. This is our G-meter, typical, as you can see, right here for 5.5, 5, and then we can take the G-limit all the way up to 3.2. 
from there here's our six pack pretty much unchanged from the time that it was in the epaa we have our airspeed indicator v and e 281 knots from there our yellow arc goes down to 250 knots so we can even be in turbulent air uh airspeed all the way up to 250 so even on it makes descent descent planning very easy so crossing in the mountains or even turbulent air we really have a no, no issue this aircraft part, uh, has been modified with two electric attitude indicators, so provide a, provide a backup. And then this Velcro around here is used for this. Used in training, so if they wanted to actually fail one, they'd be able to block it out, and then the student would be able, uh, be able to utilize that to have a standby cross check altimeter so not set in inches but it's actually set in millibars so the way that we're able to uh, get around that we actually have our millibar conversion sheet so if i get my atis and then i have my a of my particular inches of mercury i'm able to quickly convert that over to millibars which also reports to my uh, transponder as well semi attitude indicator and then this is our digital um, or this is our directional magnetic uh, compass also with our radio magnetic indicator we have a uh, flux um, flux gate in the wing and also a gyro compass in the back so electrically both of them are slaved in the four in the four and a half cockpits vertical speed indicator which is typical and this is going to be our OBS and it has two modes so if you wanted to track the TACAN we would if it was installed we'd switch it over to the TACAN switch but most of the time we leave it over in VOR which is also what we use as well as the ILS. This is a modification that, we, that we've done in addition to the the fuel gauges we'll also have installed a shade in this was not uh, present in the actual Air Force aircraft but this makes it a lot safer because we're able to track our fuel flow and then uh, we have a lot more accurate of how much actual fuel we uh, we burn moving over to our engine cluster over here our pressure is set using millibars so instead of inches of mercury for our manifold pressure we're going to set whatever is required all the way a maximum of 999 millibars which we'll encounter at sea level most of the time when we're cruising around anywhere between 750 millibars down to 650 depending on the type of altitude and then there are certain pitch and power settings that we can utilize for both instrument approaches and then in the landing pattern as well this is our fuel flow so instead of liters we have our markings here indicating gallons per hour and then to the right is our air temperature gauge from here rpm gauge we talked about maximum of 2700 rpm but most of the time we're going to be operating at that 2500 rpm and then if we're getting to cruise we have our range charts both for typical cruise and then economical cruise and that if we follow that chart we'll be able to set in a roughly about 2350 uh, rpm oil temperature and cylinder head temperatures both in, in celsius and then it was also unique this is the only airplane that i've seen that it has bars for our oil pressure so anywhere between five to about five and a half is typically what we see exhaust gas temperature here so if we're to lean the airplane out usually what we will set is anywhere between 750 and 780 degrees celsius on the egt and that will give us once we get to 10 uh, anything about a uh, thousand feet about 12 and a half gallons per hour this is our fuel is our fuel gauge with uh, new markings for gallons instead of liters. And then over by my right leg is where we set the fuel selector. So right now it is currently sitting on the right side. And then if I move it over to the left, we'll be feeding off the left tank. And if the battery were on, we'll also in the rear cockpit, it would and it show that the student is feeding off the left tank for instructor situational awareness. Down here, also by my right knee, is going to be our voltage, and this is going to be for our magneto. Bendix, dual magneto, but a single drive, so it is one of the uh, aircraft uh, that, still uses, uh, that still uses that system. Caution warning panel, which is a nice feature. It's going to give us any type of warnings, indications for low fuel pressure, fuel, uh, fuel, uh, low fuel pressure, oil pressure, any type of battery anomalies, and also that the uh, cabin is, or the cabin or the cockpit canopy is not closed and latched. This is also connected to this warning light up here. So if we get any type of alert down here, that's going to cause the master warning, this Pan A light, to illuminate to alert the uh, pilot to any type of problems they have. 
Down here, all of our electrical controls. So this, so this is our master switch, and this is our alternator, and then this is our individual controls. So for our gyro and our attitude indicators, and also for our lights, and then the, these are the ones that we've indicated. Right now, operating airspace, we have ADSB installed, and then this is also a fuel switch, uh, switch for our fuel flow. A lot of lighting, so even night flight is uh, very easy in this airplane. So a lot of uh, red lights and panel lights, which make uh, gain around at night uh, very, very easy. After the fuel selector here, Instead of circuit breakers, which are located behind me, this aircraft also has fuses. So in case of any malfunction of the instrumentation, you have to check the, to make sure that the uh, fuses are uh, properly installed. And so the checklist would have you go and uh, troubleshoot that, but you use the fuses for the various uh, electrical components and the uh, engine gauges. As we go, to our, uh, go around up here, this is our uh, uh, gear indicator lights down through green which is the uh, in the typical French style and then this is our flap gauge and the cane zero that is up and then the 15 which is going to be used for our takeoff setting and then the flaps 25 is going to be our typical landing, landing setting. When the aircraft were imported into the United States, they removed the UHF and VHF radio head along with the associated electrical uh, equipment in the back. So there is a modification. So we took a uh, Trig uh, TY-91, which is a really nice system because the two units in both the front and aft cockpit can talk to each other and be able to manipulate that and the other person can see what the uh, person is dialing in on the radio. So we have the T-191 and we also have our RTX ELT installed. This is a, this control head is for our VOR. The tack end has been removed, so the tack end portion doesn't work. But if we move this switch instead uh, from ARET, which is off, to MARCH, which is on, we'll be able to see numbers illuminated, and then we'll be able to control our VOR. Pretty much typical of any type of King or Narco 1980s radio stack. This is our audio panel down here. Most of the time we leave that just on VHF, but if the student wanted to transmit on UHF, he'd move that knob over here. But if he wanted to transmit on both radio frequencies, he would move that switch to both VHF and UHF. And then this switch is our normal, also a standby and also emergency, but most of the time we just leave that in normal. Up here on the left is our emergency gear release. So if uh, for whatever reason, if we have a gear malfunction, pull the gear circuit breaker. But then if you pull this uh, this uh, lever here, it's going to free fall the gear. And the nose gear also has a gas stab struts, which can drive the nose gear forward. So it's a very effective system in case you lose electrical and then need to troubleshoot uh, through the checklist. Beneath that is gear warning light. So when you pull the uh, manifold pressure uh, down to a low, like for landing, if the gear is not down, this is going to flash at you to remember to uh, lower, the, lower the landing gear. One of the more unique features of this airplane is this switch right here. Some people would assume that as flaps, that would be incorrect because this is the landing gear. This type of landing gear selector goes all the way back to aircraft such as the Mystere and the Mirage 3. So it's a good homage to all the French aircraft to actually what they would fly, but people have been making modifications to put a wheel there because that is actually gonna remind you what this actually, what this actually does. So, but this is our landing gear selector right here. Fuel pump, which is gonna be used for, uh, for takeoff and landing and any type of uh, problems with fuel flow and then this is also our control for our landing and taxi light from down here typical mixture control and also propeller control and then the gas is just our just our throttle so we can adjust it all the way up to max and then uh, down to you back to you idle and then most of the time for start again only have to crack it about eh, about like less than an inch uh, typically for start Beyond this guard switch right here is going to be our flap selector, and that's uh, electrically controlled, but the back cockpit has the uh, control, uh, which can override the student pilot. Trim tabs, this is for our rudder, elevator, and aileron pitch, con uh, pitch control. Most of the time, if you trim this aircraft up, again, two fingers on the stick, and again, you're going to find it very light control forces, which produce that jet-like handling quality, uh, even at uh, typical airspeeds that we operate at, kind of at 150 knots, 150 knots indicated. From here, these are our comp plug leads, which have been converted from the NATO instead of the single plug. Well, should I have the, uh, have the dual plug? And then on my left elbow here is the reservoir for our, for our tow brakes. Master cylinders in, uh, in, both, in both cockpits, and then and whoever applies the most pressure will be able, to, uh, um, be able to stop the aircraft. 
Rear cockpit is almost identical to the front, except uh, there's a, a few less switches. So mo uh, for solo operation, the student is going to be having control of the fuel uh, fuel system as well as some of the environmental um, some of the environmental controls. And then the instructor back here, he has some options to be able to emergency air restart the airplane through his uh, through his starter. He also has the ability here to be able to cut off the fuel to the engine in case of, in case there's an emergency and the student isn't able to do it himself in accordance, in accordance with the checklist. Both seats are identical with a uh, five-point harness. This uh, seat doesn't have the parachute in it, but each uh, pilot would have to carry his own parachute. And also on this strap right here, would be hooked a zero delay lanyard. So below a certain altitude, in case you had to bail out, you would have a lanyard that's connected immediately to a ripcord. So as soon as you bail out, once you leave the airplane, it's gonna pull the ripcord automatically, which could, which could make the difference, especially at low altitudes versus having to wait a few seconds and pull the, pull the, ripcord, uh, pull the ripcord yourself. But otherwise, uh, otherwise visibility from the rear cockpit, a little bit limited. So in order to be able to fly effectively, a lot of slipping is gonna be required. So sometimes when I'm flying from the, uh, from the rear cockpit, if I need to have a better view of the runway, I'm going to fly it more of a turning approach. So I can, like a, like a Corsair, anything with like a really long deck angle. So the longer I turn, the more I'll be able to have a better view of what my specific aim point is gonna be. And then a little bit of a slip prior to, so prior to the flare can help me judge my aim point as well because there's really not a whole lot of uh, blown out on the side for me to look left or right. So I'm gonna try and move the uh, yaw of the airplane and then see where I'm going and then uh, be able to coordinate the aircraft again and then go for go for touchdown. So to fly from the rear cockpit, a little bit more challenging than some of the modern trainers like the T6 or the PC21, but with a little bit of practice, even the, um, any type of instructor should be able to land effectively from the back, from the back seat. People ask me all the time, where can, where can I get one? Because the word is getting out of how much fun these airplanes are to fly. So occasionally these will be for sale for about uh, every one or two years. There's 33 in the States right now, all have been uh, spoken for, and there's no more in the French Air Force that are going to be retired. Uh, and the Portuguese aircraft aren't gonna be retired anytime soon. But for the people that know about this airplane that are that are interested, take a look at Trey Airplane Barnstormers. You never know what you buy. Uh, might find. This is the, uh, with my history with this airplane, there was a gentleman that bought a TBM aircraft and also was offered this for sale and brought this to Oshkosh in 2000. And I was a little kid and I saw it and I always wanted to have one, but I thought I would never be able to get one because the French are either going to retire them and they're going to chop them up or they're just going to sell them to another country. But uh, through good, good luck and timing, I was able to find uh, find one for sale, and ultimately uh, we were able we were able to make it happen. But this is one of the most excellent flying airplanes. I've flown a lot of them, both in military and civilian. Nothing can really compare to the jet-like handling qualities that you can get at what in aviation terms is an economical airplane. So we're very happy to have it and we're gonna we're gonna be keeping it for, for a long time. But this is the T this is the T B thirty. Keep a keep a lookout and you'll probably see one at an air show. But they're amazing French airplanes and we're happy to bring it here to you at Oshkosh in twenty twenty three.